Okay. Well, welcome everyone to a, another webinar from the Center for Research on College to Workforce Transitions at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, these webinars and seminars that we hold at CCWT are designed to just spread the word about cutting edge research about college and today secondary school transitions to the workforce um, across the disciplines. And really one of our goals at CCWT is to get some of the research that's being generated across the disciplines into the hands of practitioners in the field. And so today, I'm super excited to have Dr. Allison Lombardi from the University of Connecticut joining us. Um, Dr. Lombardi's work, which we're going to talk about today, and for those of you that haven't joined one of these webinars, um, they're very informal. Um, I'm just going to chat with Dr. Lombardi about a lot of her work. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat and we'll try to get to them. Um, but I'm really excited because um, Allison's work focuses on the construct of career readiness, which for those of us in higher education, we hear about all the time and increasingly so. But as is typical with a lot of education research, there's not a whole lot of conversation between research and measurement issues of career readiness in the K-12 world and in higher ed. Today, we're going to bridge that gap. And so, Allison, thank you again for joining us. Hi, uh, thank you for having me. Um, so let's just jump right into it. Um, you know, I just referenced the divide between higher ed and K-12 research, which kind of spans a lot of topics, um, but especially of career readiness. Um, given that many of our attendees that are on this call represent the world of higher ed or work in higher ed, though not everybody, um, can you briefly outline the history of research on career readiness in secondary schools and where we are today? Sure, yeah. Uh, so just a little bit of background um, about myself, which I think sort of answers some of the question too. Um, I am primarily uh, a um, secondary, K through 12 secondary level researcher. Um, and I've, I've been for more than 10 years now looking at how to define and measure college and career readiness. Um, particularly, I, I look at this for all youth, all high school youth, but I also am very focused on youth with disabilities who are served uh, under special education law. Um, so I, I'm, I'm often looking at sort of this special education, general education um, sort of relationship uh, in the K through 12 world and at the high school level. Um, and so, uh, you know, in terms of the history of career readiness, um, you know, I, I think that it, one thing that uh, may not um, be on uh, everyone's radar sometimes is how much uh, research uh, there is in the world of special education. Um, there's actually a very rich literature base on secondary special education and transition. So the word transition is used in special education contexts. And that's really referring to this transition from high school to adult life, whatever that might be. Um, in special education, we tend to use the words post-secondary education and employment, which to me are very similar to college and career readiness. Um, but I, I have found that sometimes those words can be very loaded and uh, can have a lot of meaning in terms of um, high school educators kind of deciding whether whether something is or is not for certain groups of kids. Um, and so a lot of the work that I do is around um, helping special education teachers uh, and general education teachers at the high school level to collaborate and support all youth together um, not just those that are served um, in special education, but, you know, broadly together in, in sort of the, you know, school-wide college and career readiness uh, model. And so that means school counselors uh, at the high school level, they typically are providing school-wide services in this, you know, sort of this area of college and career readiness. They also need to be at the table and involved in this conversation. Um, and so that's that's sort of another uh, more recent thing that I've been focusing on is how do we promote these collaborative structures between school counselors and then high school special education teachers so that they're supporting all youth. And in particular, they're supporting and including youth with disabilities in these career readiness conversations. <clears throat> so I know that there's a 
rich literature base in special education about transition. Um, and I think that oftentimes we don't tap into that enough um, when, we, when we think about career readiness outside of the world of disability. Um, I think sometimes there's an assumption that um, if it's kids with disabilities, then they're, they're over here and they have their own needs. And what, what is really important to know is that in, in the transition literature base, there's a lot of what are called transition assessments or age appropriate transition assessments. Those are actually required by law in special education um, for, for youth who are on an individualized education program or an IEP, which is essentially how um, special education services are carried out for each individual student. Um, they have to have an age appropriate transition assessment administered to them. Um, and then that data from that assessment has to be written into their IEP. Um, and that's called transition planning. Uh, and so there's a lot we can learn from, from that world in terms of the assessments that already exist. There are many assessments of what I would call career readiness, the many facets of it, um, that are already uh, very rigorous, um, fully developed and usable for all youth, not just youth with disabilities. Not very many of the transition assessments that are rigorously designed actually are dis disability specific at all. Most of them are not disability specific. So they can be very useful for all youth. But I think oftentimes we don't realize what a, what a great sort of resource we could tap into with that, that um, secondary special education literature base. So in terms of the history, I think that that's an important piece here, um, you know, is, is how can we, we bring both general and special education um, together? How can we make sure that special educators are working with school counselors to support youth, all youth with disabilities? Um, and youth in general, and then how can they all be more prepared essentially for college environments, um, <clears throat> which is then when you come in, right, <laughs> as higher education career services, um, which I see a lot of you are in those kinds of roles. Um, so that, I, I, in terms of the history, I think it's really important to, to just point out that those, those structures already exist. Um, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Um, there, there's a lot out there, but it's a matter of making sure these different um, groups, these different structures are sharing with each other, collaborating. Um, and uh, that's just one area that I try to situate myself in my current work um, uh, around um, transition assessment specifically. But then, yeah, that to me, that's very similar to this idea of career readiness. Great. Thank you, Allison. And I realized when I wrote that question for you that that's basically asking for like a year long graduate seminar, just the history of career readiness assessments and, you know, K-12 and in higher ed. Um, but in your response was brilliant. And there's a few things I want to follow up on. But the first is, can you describe to some of the career readiness assessments that are being used in secondary schools and some of the dimensions that are captured? Um, because I think I mentioned to you in, you know, in some emails we exchanged that for many career readiness assessments in higher education, the focus is on, I believe, what is called non-academic competencies or skills. Um, some of the most dominant are the NACE career readiness competencies, communication, critical thinking, and so forth. But what did the assessments look like in secondary schools that you're familiar with? I would say they're very similar to uh, what you're talking about. Um, so the, there is an assessment that I've been working on developing um, <clears throat> for the past four years. I'm actually in the fourth year of a, of a four-year uh, federally funded project to develop uh, this assessment, which we call College and Career Readiness for Transition, or CCR4T. <clears throat> and I can put actually a link in the chat for you um, about that project. Uh, <clears throat> and um, so this is just one example, but this is one where we're, you know, we're still, we're, you know, developing it, but essentially we've been, what we've found is that there's these four dimensions um, or these four domains to our assessment. So students get scores in each one of those domains that you see pictured there um, on, in, if you click on that link and on the home screen. Um, so there's academic engagement and processes, interpersonal engagement, 
ownership of learning and career development. Those are our four domains that we measure. Um, now the academic engagement and processes domain, that is more about uh, what kinds of behaviors and skills and strategies students use when they're in the classroom and they're actively learning. Um, it's not about the content that they're learning in that class because we actually have a lot of measures of academic content. We've got G grade point average. Um, and again, I'm talking about at the high school level, but grade point average is one of the more common ones that we use, right? Course grades. There's also college admissions exams like the SAT. Those are all content knowledge. That's what we're measuring. So our domain of academic engagement and processes is not measuring content. It's measuring what kinds of skills and strategies students use to be able to access that content when they're in the classroom. So whether that's learning strategies or study skills, whether it's critical thinking skills, uh, communication skills, behaviors uh, and habits um, that allow students to be productive and complete their work, um, whether that's time management. Um, so that all of that kind of is part of academic engagement and processes. And that's a domain that's, th those skills are essentially transferable across content areas. So there's not like a set of study strategies, for example, that students would only use in science class. Um, the idea is they can, they can develop these processes um, and that they can then apply across their content areas. And students have to do the same thing in college environments. So being able to practice those skills uh, in academic contexts in the, at the high school level is particularly important so that they can then transfer those skills to college classrooms and to workplace settings as well. There's many times in a workplace setting where students are being, or youth, young adults are being trained um, on how to do a certain job. They might have to read a manual. Um, they might be watching a training video, but they have, they're getting content, right, is this idea, and they have to be able to um, access that content and essentially mm -hmm. learn it and retain it. Um, so that, that's really that domain that we're measuring there, that academic engagement and processes domain. Um, but beyond that, we have another domain called interpersonal engagement, and that really is what you might think of as <coughs> Um, they're essentially skills that, that students, and again, we're trying, we're doing, we're measuring this among high school students. So I often say youth or adolescents, I'm talking about like high school age students. Um, they, uh, are going to have certain communication skills from peer to peer, from peer to adults in the building, in the school building, like teachers or other adults in the building. They also have communication skills with the outside world, like in workplace settings, um, what are sort of like professional um, workplace setting skills. Those are all interpersonal engagement skills. So it's a lot of, um, you know, what, what is appropriate conversation um, <clears throat> in certain contexts. So those really are social skills uh, well, that we, you know, classically might think of them. Um, and so we, we basically call that interpersonal engagement, but we also have a piece of that that's around like understanding who you are and your identity in the world, how you identify, um, and how how that might put you in certain groups, and what that might mean about your perspective, essentially, on the world. Um, and so that's all part of interpersonal engagement. <clears throat> um, and then we have an ownership of learning domain. And that's really pulling from that secondary special education literature base in what's called self-determination. If you may or may not be familiar with that construct, but it's this idea of, of essentially setting goals and being sort of uh, in charge of your life in, in terms of like determining what's a priority. Um, so there's a very big goal setting piece around that and sort of having the autonomy, at autonomy to be able to advocate for yourself and seek help in areas that you need. Um, and that that's ownership of learning. There's also a piece around um, letting yourself uh, make mistakes uh, and sort of grow from those mistakes. It's a sort of this growth mindset piece to that ownership of learning that's that's really important to that domain. Um, and then finally, we have a career development domain. And that one, um, it, it originally, when we first were designing the measure, it had sort of two pieces to it. One was around um, sort of like all those skills that probably all, a lot of you support uh, the development of in terms of um, interviewing skills, 
uh, resume writing skills, preparing, preparing yourself to go on job interviews and, and apply to jobs and get that work-based learning or workplace learning experience, paid work experiences, volunteer experiences, um, all those things, right? And then there was this other piece to career development that had more to do with independently living. So, um, you know, understanding how to budget money and manage money, um, understanding uh, transportation and how to get around. Um, th that was another piece to career development. And when we were refining this, this assessment over the last couple of years, we actually um, ended up taking some of those independent living skills out because they just, just didn't quite go. And from a measurement perspective, they just weren't, we weren't able to kind of hold those together and into one sort of domain. So that's kind of another big unknown that we're, we would like to continue to look at is where does independent living fall kind of in this whole readiness piece, because it is a very important part of career readiness, but we haven't quite figured out how to include it in this particular measure. Um, but that's not to say that it's not important. Um, and I'm sure you all can think about living, independent living skills amongst the students that you support and what kind of role that might play um, for those students. So this is one example. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, uh, go ahead, what, whatever you're gonna say. I was just gonna say, this is one example of, of a measure that we're, you know, we're kind of hitting on several different big areas of career readiness um, and we're trying to, to make it defined enough to have a rigorous measure of, um, but these are skills that are not systematically measured uh, amongst high school students. And so, um, you know, this is, it's very different in the sense of, of I, it can be used in the context of transition assessment, because I, as I said earlier, within special education for kids who are on IEPs, they need to have those transition assessments administered and that data needs to be worked into their IEP. Um, but for kids who are not, on IEPs, you know, which is the vast majority of kids in high schools, there really isn't any kind of like systematic way to measure these skills. Um, and so the, these kinds of assessments can be very important if, if the school prioritizes, you know, doing that work. And it, some of that has to come from, okay, who's going to do it, right? Um, and that's partly where the school counselor could come in to play, um, because they typically are the ones who are providing school-wide college and career readiness supports uh, for high school students. Great. Thank you, Allison. And that was actually what I was going to follow up with is, how do you envision this type of assessment being used in practice? And then what do people within a school or a district actually do with the data? And one of the reasons I'm asking is, um, and I would ask all of my higher ed colleagues for a minute just to think about if you had data like this in your hands, what would happen next? Who would you turn to to help interpret or apply some of these data? Because you mentioned school counselors, but I'm thinking of the ownership of learning construct you mentioned. Um, and in some of our research on internships, we have career development, which is a psychosocial construct used in vocational psychology about you know, dealing with change and um, disruption, which of, is very timely now with the pandemic. Yeah. And those are data that would be really useful for student health centers or mental health counselors, um, as well as academic advisors to work with. But one of the challenges, as you may know, being in a university is a lot of these units are separate and there's not a whole lot of bandwidth or collaboration. So I'm just curious, and your experience um, with secondary schools, how are data like this used? And are there similar challenges in trying to knit together the different people who could interpret it and then help the student? Yeah, um, so one, one direction that I'm hoping to take this research now that we've got a pretty well-developed assessment um, is to uh, create an online data reporting system, essentially that students can log into, um, teachers can log into, other school personnel can log into, that can be used as sort of like a, you know, a, like a progress monitoring type of system so that uh, these skills can be, not only can we collect data on them, but we actually can monitor progress over time and use them, use the data for different purposes. 
Um, and school counselors do a lot of that in high school already. They use different systems to look at course grades and credits and a lot of other data that, that is collected by the school, which there's a lot of data that's collected by, by high schools. Um, and so they do some of that already, but these kinds of skills that we're measuring here with the CCR4T, they're not really able to pull data around those skills. Um, and so if the system that we're hoping to develop, we would hope would be able to communicate with some of those um, school systems that are already in place. And so we're actually, I'm, when I say we, I'm talking about my colleagues and I, because I'm not doing this work by myself. <laughs> I have a, a wonderful team of people um, that, uh, that work with me. Some are at the University of Connecticut and some are at other universities. Um, but as is the case with many federally funded grants, um, you tend to have a team of, of, of key personnel. Um, and so uh, that's definitely how it is with, my, with me. And so the grant that we wrote last summer that we're, we actually haven't heard back on yet, but we usually don't hear from the federal government until around March. So we'll see what happens in March. Um, but that that grant was around creating this data reporting system, and we did have we do have a, a software company written into that proposal, and we're hoping that that software company can help help us not only build it, but also help us understand how it can communicate with existing school systems, data systems, particularly a data system that is used a lot in the Northeast is something called Naviance. I don't, may or may not be familiar with that, but that's like a school counselor type of software data system. A lot of school districts in Connecticut have that. Um, and so we would hope that this data reporting system for the CCR4T that we're building would be able to communicate with a system like Naviance so that if you're a school counselor, you can be sitting there having your counseling appointment with your students and you can see not only their course grades and all their academic data and then some of their behavioral data like attendance and um, tardies and some of the other data that's routinely collected by the school for behavior. And then you could also pull up this, this career readiness type data and have it all in the same place on the same screen so that, so that when you're talking to students, you can, you can see that, that whole picture. So that's the direction we hope to go. That's not all built yet though, but that's what we would like to do. And we think that that's, again, this is, I tend to focus on youth on IEPs, youth with disabilities who are receiving special education services, but this, what I'm talking about is not specific uh, to disability. It could be useful for all, for all high school students. Great, thank you. And that sounds similar to what some universities are using um, with some large data systems to you know, provide counselors and departments with red flags about students not turning in assignments or grades declining and so forth. Um, but it, it, you mentioned a student login too. So would there be an element of this where the students can self-reflect on their career readiness and their progress or lack thereof? Yeah, I, I do think that that's a very important piece is for students to have their own login account so that they can, again, progress monitor um, and they can take ownership of, of that, um, that development as well. We wanted to be able to do that at the high school level. So that obviously would be great to do at the college level uh, as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the vision that we have uh, for, this, for this work. Great. And if anybody has any questions about any of this work that Dr. Lombardi is describing, please feel free to put it in the chat. Um, you've already touched upon, Allison, a lot of the work that you do is oriented towards students with disabilities. Um, and that's an issue that we found in our research, primarily on college internships, that is not terribly well studied in the post-secondary sector. Um, and again, I'm confining that to work-based learning. And in practice, we've seen a whole lot of issues with students with various disabilities having trouble finding internships, pursuing them, completing them. Um, so I guess I just wanted to mention that and see if you had any thoughts about that finding and maybe any implications or ideas that you have from your work about that particular problem that I think is not just something we're picking up in our research um, here at UW-Madison. Yeah, so 
a lot of times youth and young adults with disabilities um, tend to have uh, their employment outcomes might not be as good as their peers without disabilities. Um, we actually have a lot of data to show that that's the case over time. We have data to show that among certain types of disabilities, that disparity might be greater, but for um, certain types, it's not it's not as severe. Um, so, for example, um, autistic youth uh, tend to have some of the more dismal employment outcomes um, uh, as compared to youth with, um, let's say, learning disabilities. Um, so, kind of sometimes, depending on the disability type, you youth with disabilities might seem very different um, because disability in itself is a very diverse concept. So there's a lot of diversity um, amongst uh, all youth, all people with disabilities. Um, so yeah, I, I think so. Your your question is more around to, you were just wanting me to speak on um, why might there be more challenges in sort of internship environments um, for youth with disabilities. Um, I, it was more of a global question to see if you had any thoughts um, based on your work. And I think one of the, the things we're finding is the, you know, I, I don't know if there's the right terminology, but ambulatory disabilities, there's, you know, obviously if a student's in a wheelchair, for example, getting to an internship site is very challenging. Um, and so there's, you know, been some push towards online internships for some of those students, but there's such a push for work-based learning in higher education and for students to get these so-called high-impact practices, some of which require going out to another location and doing a lot of the things that, um, you know, personally, I feel like there hasn't been a whole lot of thought into students with various disabilities and how they can access them. Um, so I guess just wondering if you had any thoughts or reaction to that general issue. Yeah, I mean, it, it does seem like one of the more um, promising uh, learning opportunities that have come out of the pandemic has been this understanding about virtual learning and um, and virtual employment, essentially, um, remote work. Um, there's actually more opportunities for remote work and more flexible work environments now than there used to be before the pandemic. And I do think that for youth with disabilities, that's been a, a bonus. I think that's been a plus um, because youth uh, might, there might be needs to, to work remotely. Um, and those needs might be greater for young adults with disabilities than, than young adults without disabilities. Um, and so I think our, our understanding has evolved quite a bit about remote work um, over the last four years. Uh, and I, I think that's actually helped uh, youth with disabilities um, because now, there are more options for internships, um, you know, that have uh, remote settings um, options than there used to be. Uh, so I, I, I think that, I hope that, that we see some of that decreasing, you know, as a result of just our, our concept of work are, you know, being a little bit more flexible. But there are gonna be some occupations and some professions where there are no remote, work options, right? And that's, there's a lot of, of professions out there where that's the case. And so I think that it's always important with a disability to think about, okay, what is the, what is the core function of the job, right? And does that require certain conditions where a person with a disability is, is not going to be able to fully learn or not going to be able to fully participate to be able to, to perform that job? Um, so, uh, for example, um, if uh, if uh, it has to be an in-person, let's say it's a a teaching internship type of of um, experience, if it has to be an in-person um, teaching uh, environment, there's no option for like an online teaching um, opportunity. Then that would need to be made very clear. Um, and then the conversation would be, okay, are you able to do any aspect of this in person? If not, then because this is, you know, primarily an in-person teaching position, then, you know, this might not be a good fit for you. So I think that just understanding what those core competencies are and understanding that, okay, is it a matter of accommodating um, access to that? Or is it a matter of, okay, this is a core competency that we can't 
um, we can't be flexible or modify enough to be able to um, accommodate a certain type of person with a certain type of disability. So like another thing that comes to mind is um, if, uh, so th this comes up a lot in the context of, of timed exams. So if an exam has a certain time, usually exams at the college level have a time limit on them, not necessarily because the concepts that are that the students are being tested on have to do with them performing them within a certain period of time. A lot of times it just has to do with the logistics of scheduling a classroom and having everybody take the exam during that time period um, and being able to clear out of that classroom before the next one comes in. Um, that's actually usually what the time limit has to do with more than anything else. Um, now, sometimes there are professions that require youth or all people, adults in general, to be able to perform a task in a certain period of time. Um, and sometimes that time is critical in order to be able to be effective at your job. So, for example, if you're um, if you're uh, an emergency response, um, uh, if you're on an emergency response team, um, you might have to be able to perform certain aspects of your job in a timely manner in order to be effective at it. Um, and so if that's the case, then yes, putting a time element on an exam is really important because a you know, student being able to perform certain tasks within a certain time is fundamental to that profession. But if it's just a matter of them being able to compute um, and show that they understand that they've learned something but it doesn't necessarily have to be within a certain period of time, which I would say the vast majority of learning is, is like that essentially, um, then, you know, then, then we can sort of take that time element out of what we're actually assessing for, right? And, and so that's where this idea of having, you know, breaking up an exam over multiple periods or giving different types of formats um, might come into play. Um, so I'm not I'm not sure if I'm totally answering your question, but the point is is that I think I think identifying what the fundamental essential competency is of that internship or of that you know the, of that environment, and then thinking about okay, is this person with a person with a disability can they access it with appropriate accommodations, or um, you know is it is there something about performing it in this way that is fundamental to being able to do that job? And there's something about the person's disability that prevents them from me being able to access that. That's really what the, the question is. And I see that David put uh, in the chat, thank you, David, um, some good resources that are very relevant to this discussion uh, from um, AHEAD, which is the Association on Higher Education and Disability, um, and their journal, which is the Journal of Post-Secondary Education and Disability. Yeah, thank you, David, and thank you, Allison, for your answer. Um, it's, it's definitely something I know a lot of my colleagues that do internship design and coordination think about, because um, we have to, but it's also an area, I think, where there's a lot of room for improvement, so um, thank you for highlighting some of the issues. Um, I'd like to turn back a little bit to the dimensions that you mentioned within your current um, research developing a career readiness uh, measurement. Um, and I had mentioned earlier, you know, one of the, the foci in higher ed is on non-academic competencies, the so-called soft skills, career readiness competencies. And I'm just wondering if you could speak a little bit about what we're missing or losing by just focusing on those. Because again, for some of the assessments out there on career readiness, they tend to focus almost exclusively on those. And so, you know, what are we missing conceptually, but also practically? when we're kind of setting aside some of these other issues, abilities, and dimensions that you've mentioned when we try to assess the student's career readiness? Um, well, I, I think that you you have to look at both academic and non-academic skills, right? So it, it can't just be one over the other, but I do think that we have a lot of measures of academic skills. We have a lot of measures of academic content. That's pretty much how we've all been functioning um, as educators for a very long time as we're measuring academic content knowledge. Um, and so just these, uh, you know, thinking about career readiness measures and being able to use that data from them alongside the academic data that you might already have um, access to, I, I think that's really important. So just kind of using multiple sources of data to look at that whole picture of a student. Um, 
is is what we're trying to to do and we're trying to get um at the high school level we're trying to get um teachers to be more fluent in looking at multiple sources of data um, and looking at different kinds of patterns of data from academic and behavioral uh, type data sources as well as career readiness um, so that they're they're better able to support students but then also for youth and their families to be able to see that data as well so that they can understand what what all those different sources of data might mean um, as like a, a whole picture. And, and maybe I'll hone in on the ownership of learning dimension, um, because again, I think that that's something that tends to be overlooked when, you know, in the post-secondary context, we're talking about career readiness. Um, you mentioned that the origins of some of that were in self-determination theory, but uh, I, I guess, could you speak a little bit more about that and why that's considered to be an important set of abilities or aptitudes for students as they go out into the world? Yeah, so um, self-determination, there's a, there's a definition that's pretty succinct around um, being able to act as one's own causal agent. And so it's this idea that you have agency over yourself, your life, um, there's a decision-making piece to that. There's this idea of you that you are uh, you have autonomy to make your own decisions, um, set goals uh, in areas where that you want to pursue, and so it's this idea that you know you have that kind of self-control um, to be, and you're able to pursue, make plans, and pursue um, different different uh, aspects of your life, and. It's got a pretty rich, the like concept of self-determination is not new. It's been around for a long time. Um, it's come out of positive psychology. Um, so it's it's very much this idea of like strengths-based, you know, focusing on um, one's strengths and building on those. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of research in this, and I'm certainly not like, um, I'm not the only one to look at it. I'm not the only one to build from it. You know, I, I talked about how it's part of, uh, you know, our ownership of learning domain, but there's so much out there on self de self determination. Um, there was a, a particularly important scholar within the the context of secondary special education and transition. His name is Michael Waymeyer, who focused on bringing this concept of self determination to special education because it was around, again, as as sort of part of positive psychology for a long time. Um, but then it was never, you know, his sort of like groundbreaking research showed that you could actually bring these concepts and teach them to young adults with disabilities and they could develop these sets of skills around um, being autonomous and, and making decisions that they could be taught those skills and that actually will make them more successful and set them up for better employment and post-secondary education outcomes later in life. And so there's a lot of research to show that that's the case, that if you if you give students these opportunities to lead um, and, and make critical decisions and be a part of, of decision-making um, in their life um, when they are in high school, then they're gonna be able to transfer those skills better later um, as young adults. So we already know there's a lot of evidence to show that that's the case. And there's actually, you know, within the context of special education, there's a whole, there's a there's different curricula that have been developed around teaching uh, youth to lead their IEP meetings because in special education that's that's how that individualized education program gets written is you have a team of professionals that come together, um, including a parent uh, or guardian and in best practices and transition you'd include the teen the youth themselves as well the person with the disability and and in this uh, this uh, self-determination kind of focused approach, you'd actually have that teen leading the group, right? They'd be leading that group of professionals and helping them understand, okay, these are my strengths, these are my goals, this is what I wanna work on um, for the next year because that's essentially what the IEP meeting is, is you're kind of setting your goals for the next year. Um, so uh, there's a lot of evidence to show that that, that's all very effective and useful if you can teach adolescents those skills. And what was groundbreaking back in the 90s and you know when when Mike Waymeyer was doing this work was that we didn't 
none of that existed in special education and that young adults weren't really, really being taught to lead, to kind of take ownership of, of their learning essentially. Um, and it, it may even have been sort of the assumption that they weren't capable of doing that. Um, but then all this research was done to show actually they are capable. And if you just do that and, and give them the space to do that, then they'll develop these self-determination skills and then they'll be um, more successful later in life, even though they are a person with a disability. And so that was actually shown with um, different groups um, with different different types of disabilities, but um, his work uh, tended to really focus on youth with more severe disabilities who really probably weren't pursuing college um, settings uh, later in life. Um, and so that actually was really groundbreaking in that you know, youth with more severe disabilities, if you teach them this set of self-determination skills, then they're going to be um, more successful in employment and, and post-secondary education later in life. So then those skills were sort of embedded in other ways. And now we actually have um, more recent research findings to show that youth without disabilities, if you teach them self-determination skills, um, then they're also going to benefit um, later in life. Um, so I, it's nice to see that that, that literature base has expanded um, across, you know, regardless of disability, we know that these are important skills. Uh, and so that was a big reason why we pulled it into the CCR4T work, because the CCR4T is intended for youth with and without disabilities. It's supposed to be used as a school-wide measure of college and career readiness. And so we should be able to measure those, those same skills regardless of disability. Uh, so that's really um, why it's it's in our model, just because of everything that we know um, about self-determination. And that's just kind of a little bit of history about where that came from and how it how it evolved uh, in the special education um, research world. Great. Thank you. And if anybody has any questions for Allison, please go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, yeah, one of the things that has recently been emphasized in a lot of these career readiness lists or assessments in higher education. Um, and it comes up in a lot of surveys of employers and what they want from their graduates. Um, it's very variously called lifelong learning, the ability to continually learn. And it's something we've heard in a lot of our employer um, interviews that we do um, at our center. But one of the things that I found, because I also have an online faculty development course, um, Allison, it's to help faculty incorporate skills. Um, we focus on self-regulated learning, because I draw on that literature, communication, teamwork, and critical thinking. But when we talk about how to teach self-regulated learning um, within a college classroom, and I've taught over 250 faculty in this course, very few have either heard about it or deliberately incorporated it into their syllabi or into how they're actually training college students as they go through four or five years or two years. Um, so you had mentioned curriculum for teaching, you know, self-determination for high school students with or without disabilities. Um, but it's one of the weak spots. And maybe, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that as a university educator. Um, it's one of the weak spots in how we're trained as future faculty or future instructors you know, how to incorporate a skill like that into how we teach. Yeah, I think being very mindful about um, the kinds of assignments, you know, as a faculty member, the kinds of assignments that you're, uh, you're providing is really important. I, I think a lot of, I mean, I'm a faculty member myself. I've been a faculty member for a long time. Um, I've been at UConn since 2012, and I'm actually going to be going up for a full professor in the next year. So that means that I've been around for a while. Um, and so I can tell you that, um, you know, it's, I think what's really hard is that none of us as faculty really have been, have been trained to be teachers. Most college faculty are very, they have very uh, uh, specialized expertise in certain content areas, and that's what's brought them to the university in a faculty role. Um, and so you could be very specialized in a certain content area and have never even thought about what's effective instruction, what's effective assessment um, for young adults. Um, and that's very common. That's <laughs> among college faculty. So that's one of the biggest challenges is that, you know, the, to be a, a high school uh, teacher, 
you get a lot of uh, training on how to be a good teacher um, in any kind of teacher prep program, but you don't get anything similar as a college faculty member. And then to top that off as a college faculty member, you usually are doing a lot more than just teaching. You're usually doing research and scholarship, you're doing service. Um, and so teaching for many of us is, is a, you know, one small part of many, many things that we're doing um, throughout our day. Um, so that makes it even harder. And, and um, so I think just being really mindful about the kinds of assignments that you're, you're um, offering and, you know, thinking about, okay, is this, is this one where they actually, you know, students actually are breaking down a task or do they already have to know how to break down a task to be able to do this whole assignment? Like if it's a big research paper, for example, is it just due at the end of the semester? Or how how could it be, how could that large task of a, a big research paper be broken out into many small assignments over the course of the semester? Um, that's one way to scaffold, you know, a, a large assignment and, and help students understand what self-regulation might look like, um, you know, for a large task like that. Um, but you know, that, I think really that comes down to really thinking about your assignments and, and what are you assigning and not thinking about it so much from a content perspective, like what do students need to absolutely have to know to be able to pass this class, which is also important, but also thinking about, okay, how are they demonstrating what they've learned to you as the, as the instructor, um, how often are they given opportunities to provide that they're th those demonstrations of learning? Um, because frequency is pretty important um, in in learning, and you know, getting feedback um, more than a couple of times in the semester is pretty important. Um, so all those things I, can be built into your class, um, but it does take uh, some time. And for some instructors, it's very different from the way you look, you may have learned. And so that's, I think, also very hard um, as a faculty member. Um, Great, thank you for that reflection. And um, I guess David offered that UNC Chapel Hill has some great resources, which I'm gonna look at this afternoon. Um, and one thing I found too is, you know, faculty and instructors too are very busy. And so to ask them to blow up a syllabus and to focus on some of these competencies is uh, going to get some resistance. But like you mentioned, Allison, there's some small things that we could do in the classes, um, you know, how we structure assignments, how we scaffold them. You know, I found uh, a lot of uh, good luck with asking students to set goals before a medium to high stakes assignment or exam. Um, and then reflect on it afterwards. Um, and so there are some things that we can do to start edging towards, um, you know, this dimension that you've included in your uh, instrument. So we've got a couple questions here too. The first from Donna, um, would the new measure be appropriate for adults? She works with adults earning GEDs, learning English, exiting corrections, et cetera. Yeah, so I, I can say that the the samples that we've been working with to validate it have been uh, students in grades nine through 12 that attend pretty typical um, high schools. Um, and uh, the sample has been, is nationally representative. So we've actually been in all of the major regions of the US. I can't say that we've been collecting data in every state, but I can say that every region's been represented. So I feel like, I feel like that's who we know is it's, you know, that's, that's who we've been working from as far as to develop the measure. I can't say that it's appropriate for other types of groups just yet, but I don't think that it's um, necessarily not, you, might, I, you know, it could very well be useful. It could yield some useful data. It's just that we haven't necessarily used it on those populations yet. So if those are areas that you're interested in measuring, you know, when, re, when looking at what the different domains are, um, and thinking about, okay, if I were to have a score, you know, for career development, or if I were to have a score for academic engagement and processes, would that help me to understand um, how to support a learner, then, then it could be appropriate. Great. Thank you, Allison. Um, there's a question from Melinda about students with Down syndrome um, and career and work development. And if any, anybody on the, the call has insights into that, because I think the question specifically about college level internships, um, but do you have any thoughts on that, Allison? So the question is what are best practices 
Uh, for students for college level internships, we have a new two year program. But Regis and the Hope is for internships. Okay. Um, so there, there actually are more programs now um, than there have ever been um, that serve uh, young adults with more severe disabilities. And we, we sometimes would think of Down syndrome as falling in that category as a, as a more severe disability. So the good news is, is that a lot of people are trying to answer that question that you've got there. Like this is not, you're not alone um, in having a new two-year program. Um, I think that uh, it's, there, there is a net, a national network called Think College. I don't know if you're familiar with that, if you've heard of that before, but I can put that link in the chat as well. Um, and this is the National Coordinating Center um, for um, what are called, we tend to call them TIPSIDs, but that's an acronym, um, which stands for, did I get that right? Yes. Um, transition program, transition to post-secondary education um, for young adults with ID, that's what the ID part in the, um, in the acronym stands for, which is, an, which is an acronym for intellectual disability, which is a category uh, and Down syndrome would fall in that category. It, and it tends to be, you, that tends to be a more severe category. And that tends to be a group of people that has not historically had access to college environments. And now you see there's these, these network, there's this National Coordinating Center right now that's that's sort of overseeing this whole network of programs and that your your program at Regis perhaps is one of these or perhaps might be modeled after these types of programs. Um, so there's a lot of resources on that site um, to look at uh, around answering your question. I do think that some of the things, some of the challenges, I, I don't run one of those programs myself, but I know a lot of um, great colleagues who are really involved in running those programs. And I know that some of the challenges that they've faced over the, the last five years or so as these programs have really um, grown has been around um, having sort of the expectation in high school that you'll have paraprofessional or one-on-one -on -one support and then whether or not that support then follows you into the college environment. And so Think College would say, their guidance would say that you really need to sort of go move away from this idea of a one-on-one -on -one or a paraprofessional type model um, and that that's not an effective, um, as effective of a way to uh, support young adults in college settings for a variety of reasons. We actually know um, from a lot of research that for high school kids who have paraprofessional support in the classroom, that they're actually less likely to um, be able to build friendships with other kids in the classroom. Um, because a lot of times other kids don't want to talk to the kid who's got the adult following him or her around, right? They might just, that might just be a barrier in and of itself. And so thinking about, okay, what kind of support does the paraprofessional providing? And is there a different way that that young adult can get that support without having a person actually following them around? And so that's where a lot of technology has come into play. Um, and, you know, different kinds of apps have uh, been useful for organization um, and for reminding and prompting. Um, and those kinds of supports are a lot of what um, this population might might need um, and um, a lot of what a paraprofessional pair, pair might be offering. Um, but can it be done, you know, with, you know, that looks a little bit more like what everybody would use, right? Um, like, a, like a device. Uh, so like that's just one example, but there's there's a lot of, of resources on that thing college site. So if you if you are you know starting a program like that at your college, I would de definitely recommend connecting with that network and and seeing um, the different resources that they have, um, because they've been doing this kind of work for for a while now. Um, they're actually in their second five year cycle of funding of being the national coordinating center. So they've been they've been at this for at least ten years now. So I think they're doing a really great job. Great, thank you, Allison. And we will end with this wonderful question by um, Alicia. Um, I'm glad that you raised this because it's a really good one. And what are some of the key external or internal factors that you have found are correlated with or influence student ratings on their college and career readiness assessments? So we actually have a um, published paper um, that where we uh, took 
the four domain scores from one of our samples. It was our first field test sample, which was um, a sample made up of five, five high schools um, in three different states. Um, we actually found that when we correlated those four domain scores with other sources of data from those schools and on those students, we actually found that for like we had, for example, GPA data, we had PSAT data, and we had attendance data. And those are pretty routinely um, collected types of data in academic and behavioral areas that schools are going to collect, right? Um, at least at the high school level. Uh, and we actually found that our domain scores were correlated in the direction that you would expect or want them to be uh, with those variables. So for example, there was a positive correlation between GPA and the four domain scores. So the idea being that the better your GPA might be, the higher your career development perception or rating score would be. Um, and same thing with the PSAT, the same kind of positive uh, correlation there. And then with the attendance data, we had a number of absences was the variable we were working with. And, and that we actually saw a negative uh, correlation or an inverse relationship in the sense that the more absences you would have as a student than the lower your career development score was or your academic engagement and processing score. So, so yes, we did that specifically to look at that self-report bias piece of any, and any kind of rating perception scale is gonna you know, have that self-report bias piece. And it's pretty common practice in the measurement world to look at this correlational data with, you know, already pre-established existing measures and then the measure that you're trying to develop. And so for us, that was good evidence to show that um, we, you know, we were getting at something with our measure um, because the, cor the correlations weren't so, they weren't so highly correlated that they were essentially suggesting that we were measuring the same thing, right? As uh, there's sort of like a, a sweet spot you want to get to with the correlational relationship. You want to you want to have a, 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 a strong enough relationship to show that they're related, but not too related so that you're actually measuring the same thing. And so ours were in kind of in that zone. Um, and I can put a link to that paper um, on the chat in a moment, but it's uh, it's uh, published in a journal called Career Development and Transition for Exceptional Individuals. Um, and if you'd want to contact me directly, um, if you don't have access to it, um, if it's behind a paywall for you, I'd be happy to send the PDF version. Great, Allison. Thank you for thinking of the paywall issue. That's common. Um, I just want to thank you, um, Allison, for joining us for this hour-long conversation. I, I feel even more now that there's a whole lot we can learn from the higher ed career readiness sphere about um, research in the measurement world and students with disabilities and just generally in the K-12 um, research on the topic. So thank you very much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Oh, sure. No problem. Thanks for having me. And I'm just putting that link in the chat now if you were interested in that paper. Um, and yeah, thanks. Thanks for, for listening. It was, it was nice to be here. Um, feel free to contact me. I don't think I put my contact information in there. Uh, but I can. I'll put my email address in the chat for you right now. Excellent. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, we have some more webinars and seminars coming up. They're up on our CCWT website. But in the meantime, stay warm um, wherever you are. Bye-bye.